So we have working quantum computers now, but they are still inferior to classical computers. So yep. I'll say it that way. 2023, we'll get 1,000 qubits. 50% chance it'll do something. Very quickly, explain cannot, what a qubit is. Since, uh, I mean, maybe everybody knows what a qubit is. It's Davos, <laughs> but explain what a qubit is. A quantum bit. So no, classical computers work on normal bits. So think of a qubit as being somewhat approximately telling you the power of a quantum computer. And is it a, at 1,000 or 5,000? Somewhere in there, a quantum computer is likely to cross over what anything classical can do, but cross over in a way that probably classical cannot catch up to. So that is why that is an exciting time period. The problems, actually, we just talked about sustainability. So number one, it's going to be able to work on new alloys and new materials. Probably pharmaceuticals are way down the road because there's a bit more complexity in life and death issues. So I'll phrase it that way. Uh, optimization, you talked about uh, the fleet management uh, um, problem. I think there'll be applications to AI and search, but I think on search, I think Ruth and Google will be far more expert than anything we will do. I think one of the big problems is going to be around climate change. By the way, plankton consume uh, more carbon dioxide than everything else. It's a pretty simple mechanism, but there's zero chance that classical computers are going to figure out how that works. I have a hope that uh, quantum computers can because you're operating at biochemistry levels, and uh, that's what quantum computers do. They, they mimic what is happening at the quantum mechanical level. And so there's a chance that they can do problems like nitrogen, uh, carbon dioxide sequestration, because that in the end is a materials problem. Wait, explain, explain what you mean about, about plankton. Why can't a classical computer model what plankton does? Well, a uh, classical computer, I'll take the caffeine molecule. I'll say the caffeine molecule is a little bit simpler than plankton. A caffeine molecule on a normal classical supercomputer needs a, a computer the size of this planet. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So to get all the way to a complete uh, organic mechanism like plankton is impossible. Quantum supremacy sounds so scary. Commercial advantage. Yeah. I'll go to commercial advantage. Great. When will we have commercial advantage? 2025 would be my prediction. 2025? Not that far. No, that's not that far at all. All right. Uh, Ruth, do you agree? You guys are building a quantum computer. We are, and I think you know, we, the breakthroughs we've had in quantum computing have come probably faster than we even expected, but very much to your point, it's going to take a while before there's commercial application. Like all technologies, the pace, they build on themselves, and so we're continuing to learn and accelerate growth. So 2025 is as good a guess as I can come up with. Antonio? But while we work on that, which is so exciting and revolutionary in many ways, there are also big advances we can drive in the current way we think about conventional computing mm -hmm. and think about sustainability along the way. If you think about this room, I mean, problem TV looks big, but it's actually fairly small, as you see. We have air, and most of the systems today are air-cooled. But think about liquid uh, way to cool systems down, like this glass of water probably is more efficient than the entire room of air. So there is ways to go accelerate the computing aspect as the data continue to outpace computing capacity and do it in a sustainable way. At the same time, you think about the current architecture of computing has been for 70 years, Arvind, in the making. And we'll talk about the model's law and talk about how many transistors we can pack on a, on a, on a chip. The fact of the matter is we have to invert the system. We have to think about a data-driven computing, not a CPU-driven computing. And I think that's, a, in my view, as exciting as quantum computing. Because in the end, you can be way more efficient, thousand times, way more cheaper in that, and way more sustainable at the same time. So what time. exactly is the mind shift you're describing? It's what we call the memory-driven computing. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you think about the architecture of a computer, no different than a phone, for that matter, which is a computer, you have a CPU, you have memory and storage. We believe the memory and the storage have to collapse, be persistent, so you need less and less power at a massive scale, and then bring the computing part of it, the CPU, which can be a quantum computing to the data. So what is the friction? Moving data. Even in your phone, you're moving data all the time. It gets hot, and therefore it consumes energy. But we can flip that around. So you're collapsing the memory and the storage into the CPU, and it makes everything no, more efficient. collapsing the memory storage into one single entity and reverse the order by which we compute. That's the key. Oh, I see. Okay. And by the way, you don't need gold, you don't need minerals. You can use things like silicon photonics, mm -hmm. way cheaper, um, easier to manufacture than a, a qubit. 
Should we be scared of quantum computing because it will break encryption? Look, you're going to need quantum computers with millions of qubits and completely mm -hmm. error-free before that happens. One. Two, it will break today's encryptions as they're commonly used because they're based on how do you factor large numbers. And quantum computers at that scale, so I'll come back to when we'll get quantum computers at that scale. The other part, which is uh, what ought, people ought to do, there is plenty of known encryption techniques which cannot be broken by quantum computers. So go ahead and deploy those. And by the way, certain enterprises already have. A lot of sophisticated enterprises are deploying these techniques and government standards are working on them, albeit slower than I would like. They could have worked on them a half a dozen years ago as opposed to waiting till this point. So when are you going to get million qubit quantum computers? That's probably a decade or more away. When are they going to be error free? That's where there's a big debate. Some people claim never, and some people say... But you don't actually need a quantum computer to be error free, you just need enough qubits so you can compensate for the errors, right? Uh, you begin to blow up in terms of uh, how big it gets. So right now people say you'll need like 10 or 100 qubits for every mm -hmm. uh, qubit if you wanted to sort of emulate something that is error free. Okay. So I think this is, this is at least a decade away, and I'm not worried about it because if we change now on the encryption standards, <laughs> then it can't break it. This will be highly relevant for the communications networks uh, as well. Right now we are all building 5G networks as we know, but by the time comp uh, quantum computing is maturing for commercial applications, we are going to be talking about 6G. And 6G will hit the commercial market around 2030. And as I said earlier, we're going to have a digital twin of everything, and that's going to require massive computational resources, including over the air interface. It's, it's a significant computing challenge to be able to transmit all those bits that the industrial metaverse will need over the air. We are going to need at least 100 times, if not 1,000 times faster, faster uh, networks uh, over the uh, air. So their com quantum computing definitely may play a significant role already in the 6G era. The question will be that there's going to be a lot of distributed computing in 6G. Small cloud servers here and there and, and, and a lot of intelligence in the, in, the, in the radio stations and radio base stations and so on that will quantum computing scale to decentralized applications as well or counter argument how long will it be relevant only for, for massive centralized data centers. That's something that at least to me is still, still an unanswered question. I'll pick just one application and that's chemistry and my, uh, my conviction uh, is that we can't do chemistry until we have a quantum computer. Now that's deliberately provocative and it's also deliberately true in the sense that if you cannot simulate the, the building blocks of the world that you find around you or the world that you want to build, as we cannot with chemistry, then what are you really doing? It's the equivalent of trying to do advanced uh, engineering and technology without the aid of a conventional computer. And if you need some proof that uh, we are at, at a, an extremely primitive stage with chemistry. You just need to look at the natural world around you. Life over billions of years has used exactly the same tool set that we have. They got the same chemistry set that we got and over billions of years has evolved to be able to perform you know, miracles like you know, turning sunlight into energy, turning uh, water and nitrogen into ammonia to fertilize plants, reproduction and so on. And the task for us is, uh, is extremely challenging on a conventional computer because uh, you know, the, the, the problem grows exponentially, so large instances of chemistry are forever beyond reach of any conventional computer that we can ever build. Okay, chemistry, it's a, it's, a, it's a subject from school. It underpins everything that humans do, everything, whether it's, you know, a molecule in our body, it's a material that we want to deploy, uh, you know, to tackle climate change or healthcare, you name it, we need right. that chemical explanation. I believe that we're going to look back on our pre-quantum computing world and wonder how on earth did we survive, never mind sustain a population of near on 10 billion people with those primitive caveman tools. Right. Beyond just quantum computing, there's other quantum technologies that are here and now that we also need to bring into this conversation. So when we think about quantum, quantum computing is a core bedrock, but we also have, for example, quantum sensing. And in quantum sensing, we can build diamonds Diamonds that instead of just being made of pure carbon, we dope in some nitrogen, we make them slightly different, we grow them from scratch in a facility, these are not from the ground, and we can use these diamonds as very sensitive magnetometers. And what can we do with these? We can actually detect, for example, the very faint magnetic signal of your heart. 
Everyone here, I'm sure, has had an ECG, electrocardiography, but now we can do MCG, magnetocardiography. And one of the reasons why cardiovascular disease continues to be one of the top killers in the world, here in Europe, in the US, around the world, is that we don't have good enough diagnostic devices. But going into the magnetic realm, using quantum diamonds, using quantum sensing, we can now start to do that. Another application that we can do again in the near term is navigation around the world without GPS. Right now, Russia is blocking and jamming the signal of GPS over Ukraine to frustrate the Ukrainians. But using the orthomagnetic field, we can actually navigate. Birds do that, whales do that, we humans can now do that. So quantum sensors are, we have a device right now in clinical trials, so we can do these things in the very near term. We don't need millions and millions of qubits. When it comes to quantum computing, it's a critical, fundamental technology. We are the first generation of humans that will not only have wonderful activity in the bits world, but also now in the world of atoms. And as, just building on what Jeremy said, it's critical to not just the chemistry also of the body, but also, for example, material science for clean tech. If we want to have better batteries for electric vehicles, better batteries to store renewable energy, we need to simulate these kinds of molecules and atoms in, in using the quantum equations. And this is why this is a fundamental shift in how we do computing. We have built devices now, here now. They're in the hospital right now in clinical trials. So quantum sensors are very near term. We don't need millions of qubits, we don't need error correction, we can build those today. And one hope of this panel is to broaden the conversation about quantum from just, just quantum computing, fundamental, but also now include many other quantum technologies. If you've been in an MRI machine, you've been in a quantum sensor. MRIs were built by physicists using quantum principles. But today the world of quantum computing has around 100 qubits. Right. And um, there has been a lot of hope over the last five or six years that people could find something useful to do with around 100 to 1,000 qubits. That has not so far panned out. It looks unlikely that it will pan out. And um, that's the source of a lot of confusion out there in the world is that many people are uh, of the belief that we have it now that it's ch or that it's, that it's you know, right. tomorrow because you know, we have 100 qubits and with 100 qubits we, we uh, could be able to do something useful. Right. So far not. The million qubit regime, it's been my personal conviction for more than 20 years that we will need to leverage the semiconductor industry and the 50 years and trillion dollars that went into that industry in order to deliver that technology and that's what we are doing um, and that's why um, I believe that we're in a regime where well within this decade we're going to be deploying this technology. Okay. Unfortunately, the folks who started blockchain picked two particular encryption standards. Blockchain needs public key encryption. That's what it needs, signatures and encryption to make it work. They chose RSA and ECC, the two encryption standards that quantum breaks. So the good news is, again, that we now have post-quantum crypto protocols. Uh, we can take a measured transition over the next four or five years for blockchain. And we have to work with the blockchain community. Part of what happened here in Davos this week is that the Web3 blockchain community and those of us in the quantum community started to meet. And we're meeting because we need an orderly transition of the underlying building blocks of blockchain itself. We need to move blockchain from RSA, ECC, lots of acronyms, sorry about that, but these are just acronyms that mean the current encryption standard. We need to move it to the quantum safe encryption standards. We have about four or five years to make that happen. We have the time, we have a plan, but we really need the participation, Jillian, of the blockchain community to do that. And we already saw how difficult it is to move from proof of work to proof of stake, which is a critical change to bring down the carbon footprint of, of blockchain. We now need to restore the pillars and fundamentals of the security of the blockchain by moving it to the post-quantum protocols. First, I think it's one of the wonderful things about quantum is that it's born cloud native. If you look at the past 40 years of computing hardware, it was on premises. You had to buy these large machines, install them in your facility, and then amortize that use over say seven, eight years, and then go to the next generation. And that's the history of IBM 360, DEC, Sun, SGI, Dell, Lenovo, so on and so forth. This being cloud native is a really big advantage because we want it meshed together. We want CPU, GPU, and QPU, quantum processing unit. We want them all interacting with each other. These specialized chemistry applications, for example, on quantum, that's what you run on quantum, and then interacting with CPU and GPU. So all that is cloud-based. So the good news is that right now already, 
um, academic students, corporations can get access to very, very primitive quantum computers, but that portends well for the future in terms of access when we get scaled, fault tolerant quantum computers. Absolutely correct. This is not just a blockchain issue. This is fundamental to the entire financial banking system. This is not only data in motion, i.e. payments, transactions, as they're moving through the SWIFT system, through other systems that we have around the world, it's also the data at rest. It, under the compliance regimes around the world, banks and others are required to keep the records of their customers for 10 to 20 years. This is why we must move the encryption. We have to re-encrypt all that information into the new standards because of SNDO, because of the steal now, decrypt later attack that is underway right now. So it's fundamental both for the data that we have at banks today, at pharma, at governments, at telcos, and also fundamental to the data in motion.